What's going on, Throne Thrones fans? I'm back again with my good buddy Joe from Cincinnati. Uh, we heard your calls for another pack review by us, and we decided that you know we don't need to do them in order, so we just do whatever we want. And honestly, we we could have done one earlier if Throne Shamaru did not disappear for literally four months. Yeah. Where it's just like, oh, where the fuck is Shamar? <laughs> Nobody knows where Shamar is. Oh, you texted him and he didn't respond? Classic. Well, I mean, I think I told everyone kind of beforehand that I had some renovations and stuff and I was moving and all that stuff that kept me out of the game for a little bit. But we are back. I think we only skipped like <laughs> three packs. I don't even know how many packs we've missed. Three packs, yeah. One or two. And we didn't do the first one. We did two and now we're at six. Yeah, yeah so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> you guys figured it out without us. Um, so yeah, we're jumping into Tyrion's Chain, uh, a very exciting pack, lots of stuff that helps out Greyjoy, or at least can be played in Greyjoy, I don't know if it actually helps us. I thought it was a fantastic pack for Greyjoy. I mean, I think they were one of the winners in terms of uh, cards they got in this pack, but we can get to that as we go through the cards. Yes, we will. And I was mostly referring to the banner, like trying to banner in Baratheon, which we'll see in a little bit. Um, so <laughs> we are going to jump straight in. We've got card number one. Let me just make sure I get these up on the screen properly. Uh, boom. Card number one. I guess I'll go first, Joe, and then you can read the next one, and we'll keep alternating like that because we're so It's your world, Shamar. I just live in it. <laughs> All right. So we've got card number one, House Manderly Knight, which is a two-cost uh, military and power icon with one strength. House Manderly and obviously the Knight trait. <laughs> While there is a winter plot card revealed, House Manderly Knight gets plus two strength. Thoughts, sir? I think the most interesting part of this card is that its title is in its traits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's by design. That's a great design right there. <laughs> Never forget. But on, other than that, honestly, uh, I don't know why you'd really run this other than uh, uh, instead of house Tully knight unless you're craving for more than three two cost military power bicon knights mm -hmm. uh the tumblestone knight also has the house Tully keyword so you also get that synergy with the blackfish and and you know uh we saw a couple spoilers for uh hoster Tully who gives all Tully characters renown and things like that so when I'm looking at this card versus Tumblestone Knight, I'm curious why you'd play this card. Mm -hmm. Just for the one additional strength, maybe sometimes one Winter Plot is revealed. I don't really get it. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with you there. I mean, it's kind of a cool idea to think that, uh, you know, you make your Stark deck with a whole bunch of Winter Plots and now Winterfell is all the more effective or you pray that your opponent plays a Winter, but... That's a lot of wishing and praying and having to play plots that you probably wouldn't want to play just to get this guy up to the three strengths. So I totally agree. There are better knights to choose from. Um, I don't know. I can't really see this card being played over any of the other options just because they're more consistent. If if House Manderly becomes something or if Stark gets more winter tech that makes him want to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. But I remember um, with that one knight, I forget who it was, the Baratheon knight. Mm -hmm. That kneels when you lose an intrigue challenge. Yep. Uh, when that guy came out, people were like, "Oh, it's like a bastard, uh, bastard uh, in, hiding. in hiding, but gets one extra strength and kneels up occasionally." It's like that one extra strength did nothing for it. Yeah. And that card is never played. Mm -hmm. So, in this, I, I think it's the same thing. Is the opportunity to get plus one strength sometimes? It just seems, I mean, unnecessary. I totally agree with you, and that's. All we've got to say about that. So, it's a boring card. It's pretty boring. Moving <laughs> on. We've got Wolf in the Night, Joe. All right. Wolf in the Night is a one-cost event loyal to Stark. It's a song. Action. Choose a Stark character that is attacking alone. Until the end of the challenge, that character gets plus three strength and gains renown. I can see you nodding your head. Yeah, that's Let's, pretty sick. You want this card. <laughs> that's pretty good. I think it's okay. It's, okay. it's not. It's not the greatest, but it's okay for one certain character that I can think of. Which what's what is that one character? Uh, what's that? The bald guy that's like polishing a, a sword or something. What's his name? I think he's bald in the in the picture, it's isn't he? It's a bald guy that's polishing a sword. Isn't he bald? I don't know if he's actually bald. You're really testing me on this one. Uh, Come on, you can think of who this guy is. A bald Stark character that's polishing a sword. Yeah, man, and. 
after he wins a challenge, based on his strength, he kills people. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can see that. I mean, this, he's like it's, a Bruce Bolton. Bruce Bolton, yeah. It's it's kind of combo. -y. He's he's reading a book, by the way. Oh, I thought he was polishing a sword. I don't know. I thought he was doing something <laughs> something a lot cooler, considering his ability. Like he's just reading a book. That's kind of boring. My bad. So yeah, I think with Bruce Bolton, that that would be pretty cool. Um, the fact that Bruce Bolton doesn't really pop off all that much, at least as I've seen. I've tried to test him a lot, and he's been a pretty underwhelming card thus far. Uh, there's so many other options to play instead of him. I find I don't know. Oh. We're we're kind of getting into roofs, but yeah, I, I think six cost for a sacrifice effect like that is kind of odd, especially since without modifiers, it's only four strength, so you're killing maybe one meaningful character mm -hmm. uh, or a couple chud if that's the way you're going with it. But I mean, you can add needle to him and lady and this, but then you're just I mean that's a combo that you're not really going to pull off all that often, that's especially right. for a character that you're sacrificing. Yeah, so. but then going back to just the regular start characters that could benefit from this. Uh, it would be really nice to have this on an Aria, for example, if you have very limited options. Corset Aria, of course. If you have very yeah. limited options and you really need to push that military challenge through because she's got an ice on her or whatever have you. Um, I think that it's a d probably going to be a very difficult card to fit into a deck because Stark decks are already very tight, I would say, in terms of uh, what people are trying to pack into those. Yeah, that's the, that's the issue I have with it is just... You know where do you find space for it? Because you're already you're already not running for the north, which, I mean, it's not a great card either. But it it replaces itself. Mm -hmm. If you win, you draw another card, mm -hmm. uh, and that doesn't make it into decks. So I I'm not sure why this would, especially since so many of your characters that you would be able to win a challenge alone with, already have renown. Right. Like Blackfish has renown. Fast Eddie has renown, even though you never want to go in a challenge alone with him. Alone. Oh, that's right. But. Uh, you know, it, it, Rob is, has renown already. You know, so I don't know. It's it seems someone could prove me wrong, but I, I just think it's not going to be seen play at all. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that one. The fact that it has to be attacking alone is something that limits this card a lot. Yeah, if it were participating alone, I could see it having a little more applicability, just because it's never a bad thing to unexpectedly win a, a challenge on defense and then get a power out of it and and everything but if since it's attacking I, i'm not sure that is agreeable sir so we move on finally this card comes out because you know you win him the play mat with him on it and you're like why is this guy on my play mat if there's no card to match it so that is as we move into the tyrell cards uh three costs i huh? i was still saying why is this guy on my play mat <laughs> true <laughs> i mean when you think about what he did in the in the series he really didn't do much his brother is, is more known for dying in the first two pages of the very first book so yeah. i would think he's more renowned um so sarobar royce three cost military icon he is non-loyal four strength and another knight for tyro reaction after a summer plot card is revealed sarobar royce gains one power Limit once per phase. Forced reaction after a winter plot card is revealed. Neil Sirobar Royce. So, when I first saw this card, uh, it was before Valor came out. Mm -hmm. And it was when there was still plenty of Lannister all over the place. And First Snow of Winter was the key uh, plot that really defined the meta in a lot of ways. So, when I first saw this guy, it was like a three cost character that gets power. This is never going to see play. Because mm -hmm. as soon as he gets any meaningful type of power on him, one, two, three power, they can just play first Snow of Winter, and then he's back in your hand, and then you're like, well, oh, shit, what am I supposed to do with this guy now? Replay him and start stacking again. And then the fact that Winter plots Neil him anyway, mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that he's a monocon, a military monocon, in fact, you're not really getting very much use out of him overall, uh, especially since a lot, of, a lot of these Tyrell decks do just... I do a 27 strength power challenge <laughs> and get 8 renown. I don't really know where this guy sits, but after Valar came out and First Snow of Winter started to leave the meta a little bit, I, I, I re I, then this guy came out, obviously. And it's like, eh, he's good. He's a good one of, you know. Yeah. If, you just, if you have summer plots already, just put one of them in there. He gets renown if you play the knight's plot that gives knight's renown, and he gets power from summer plots. That's What's, right. What's to lose? 
Yeah, and he, I guess, is another target uh, for Lady Sansa's Rose if you have that floating around in your deck as well. So in terms of, of that aspect or that style of deck, I mean, that's that's great. But still, for me, I don't really like that forced reaction of the Winter Plots coming into play and kneeling him. Um, because it can be your opponent's Winter Plot as well, obviously, and you never really yeah. know what to expect out of an opponent's deck in a larger scale tournament. If you're playing in a very small meta and you can kind of gauge where people are at, then fine. But in terms of playing a card like this at, let's say, a Nationals, that is probably why you would want to play more than one copy because it would suck if you had this guy duped out on the board <laughs> and you're playing against a Kings of Winter deck and he's just... He's kneeling, kneeling him player. every single turn. And and granted, you can get the power and kneel him in the same turn. If you flip a summer, your opponent flips a winter, you still gain the power. It doesn't negate it. Like a lot of a lot of winter summer effects kind of negate each other. These don't negate each other, which is nice. Mm -hmm. uh, but and then I, I did notice uh, it says limit once per phase, so if you're running rains, you could theoretically flip two summer plots in one round. There aren't any summer schemes yet, I don't yeah. think. But maybe in the future that could happen. The, uh, I don't know. Is the Tyrell... What's the Tyrell unique plot? That's not a summer plot, is it? Um, no. No, it's not. Okay. But it's, no, it's is not. it a scheme? I, I feel like it, it is. The I scheme think it's not summer. Yeah, I think it's a scheme. It's not summer. Okay. Yeah. So. All in all, he's, he's pretty decent. Um, probably doesn't need to get thrown into any decks he's not like an immediate i need to play this but uh a pretty cool option to throw into your decks if you want to match that nice play mat from store champs <laughs> i guess i don't know you have the you have the store championship play mat and you play this guy on him it's a dupe so he doesn't he doesn't die to valar that's right <laughs> you put it right on the guy's face and he's immune to valar that's i right. think that's how it works right and then discard your play mat and because <laughs> it's so bad. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. All right. So moving on, Renly's Pavilion. Uh, that one is to you, sir. Yeah, it's a two-cost location. Renly's Pavilion. It's loyal to Tyrell. Westeros trait action. Neil Renly's Pavilion to choose two characters until the end of the phase. One of those characters gets minus one strength, and the other gets plus one strength. What do you think? I like this card because it's annoying. <laughs> I mean, I don't want it to ever get played on me, but usually when a card like this, I feel like it's annoying. That means that it's an okay card to play. So if Renly's Pavilion came out on my opponent's board and they were able to give Balin minus one strength until the end of the freaking challenge phase, <laughs> and let's just say Randall Tarly gets the plus one and stands, I would be very, very upset. Uh, I know. So... I think that it's priced correctly. I like that it's two cost and it's only a plus one and minus one, but that is still a pretty big swing in terms of the strength on the board. If they're able to, you know, force you into choosing which character can participate in the challenge that they're going to throw in. And you know that Tyrell has ways to do that. So I think this is a very good card for them. Well, when I think of this card, you know, it's so easy to, to say like, oh, oh, only two strengths is not a big deal. But how many how many times did your opponent count up your power strength and say like how much power do you have how much strength do you have for power fifteen okay I'll do a power challenge for sixteen yeah you know what I mean and and so that's that's so common and this card really makes it so they have to go you know two over that mm -hmm. so they're like okay how much do you have fifteen all right I have to do what is it a uh, uh, seventeen now because no uh, sixteen. Anyway, <laughs> it creates math problems. It yeah. creates problems in math, and it's creating them for me right now. So, yep. uh, and then, like you said, it stands Randall. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns off. It, it really hurts Balin, Core Balin's ability. Like you said, I think it's a solid card. I mean, I don't. I don't see any reason not to run it in a Tyrell deck because it's 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 really it's kind of two thirds of a Marjorie, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. And and you do it every single turn. It's it's great. I think it's great. And you know that you're gonna have Marjorie out on the board anyways to combine with this, so it I think is it's a really good card for for Tyrell. One of the nicer ones that I've seen for them uh, of late. They usually do get the the crappy end of the stick, but this seems to finally be a very good card that plays into their style of play. I They've think. been doing pretty well this cycle though. They got they got a uh, Renly. The they got a uh, Brienne. 
They got Offer of a Peach. I mean, they got some good cards this cycle. Mm-hmm. They're not Night's Watch cards, but they're good cards. <laughs> <laughs> It's too soon, man. <laughs> it's too soon. <laughs> oh, so, God. Anything else to say on this card? No, that's it. That's it. That's all we got. Just so now, speak of the devil, we're moving on to Corrin. Night's Watch cards. <sighs> so we've got <laughs> Corin Half Hand. He's obviously <laughs> unique. Uh, non loyal, six cost, a bicon with military and power, five strength and renown. No attachments except weapon. Ooh, ooh. No attachments except weapon. So you can't blank them, but they can long claw him and freaking practice blade and all that nonsense can get thrown down on this guy, which is all that amazing. nonsense. Reaction: After you win a military challenge in which Corn Halfhand is participating, choose and kill a non-unique character <laughs> with a lower strength than his, controlled by the losing opponent. He's got five strength. Okay, but he's got five. Six that's, with the wall. That's already godlike. Six with the wall. Okay. Now, if he's participating, so even if you just throw a castle black on him and now he's up to seven, if he has a practice blade on him or a long claw, <laughs> even though you probably wouldn't throw a long claw because he already has the renown or whatever, but he is killing everything. So there's so many good non unique characters, I think. And the fact that, like, I could have, let's say, a drowned man out with two three warships and i'm sitting pretty you know <laughs> and that guy who's not even participating in this challenge just dies because corn's just chilling with his blade yeah what's up guys just kill stuff because <laughs> he's going to be winning challenges you know he's going to participate and be winning that shit all day so i'm well, not happy i'm not happy well okay i have a way to get around this guy all right are you ready yeah you ready i'm waiting don't don't initiate military challenges. <laughs> if you don't initiate military challenges, this guy is essentially a blank renowned character. Problem solved. The the problem is he's still getting that renown. <laughs> the problem is the wall is still not going down, so that's another two power. Well, only only if you do a power challenge. I mean, don't do a power challenge. Then he's not getting the renown either. Oh my god. I guess the, the only saving grace here is that he doesn't have stealth. So you can, <laughs> you know... Cancel out his reaction in that way, maybe. The stealth around him. Hopefully. And unless Benjamin's out. Unless Benjamin's out, true, because he is a ranger. But I know next pack there's gonna be a card that's like, give all Night's Watch characters stealth, just because. That's, well, there's a card that's the next card in this pack that gives all Night's Watch rangers stealth. Oh, but really? I don't. <laughs> oh my god. Are you? Are you sure? But 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 honestly, in addition to that, being able to defend and kill characters, the one thing I love is that he kills pyromancers, mm-hmm. which, fuck pyromancers. I mean, honestly, fuck hey, pyromancers. Why? Because they can stop your damn deck? Like, <laughs> come on. Come on, FFG. <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking. Anyway, uh. he can kill pyromancers, but also uh, there's a new deck. Well, it's not new, but a deck is coming back that... Uh, you know, is is all attrition based. So you got put to the swords, you got Yorin, you got March to the Wall, two claim plots and everything like that, and then Corin, and it makes it so that he can kill a Chud mm-hmm. right before a two claim military attack, or he can uh, he can kill a Chud before a military attack, put the so- put to the sword somebody, and then you march next turn, and they have to march a valuable character, mm-hmm. and then you knight gathers to buy that character. Mm-hmm. So there's a I mean, he. What I love about Corn is he works in both the wall decks and the non-wall decks for Night's Watch. Like most most Night's Watch cards are one or the other. Like Night Gathers, you're not playing in a wall deck. Mm-hmm. Uh, Castle Black, you're not playing in a in a in a an offensive deck. But Corn fits in both perfectly, yeah. and it's great. So that in that sense, I can appreciate the design of this because it does promote the idea of moving Night's Watch into a more aggressive. Uh, base play style so that design space I'm enjoying that they're moving that way but at the same time like don't make him a ranger I know he is <laughs> just don't give him a trait <laughs> god damn it just make him blank and, and then also, oh god so anyways he, he costs six though so that's good too yeah he costs six so that's but I, I also want to point out uh, he works well he works, he works really well with uh, Bridge of Skulls 
-hmm. It's that uh, one cost location from the Alliance of Castellar Rock deluxe box. It says, like, you know, uh, choose an opponent that didn't declare a military challenge against you this round. They must discard a card from their hand at random, something like that. So if you have that in Corrin out, you're like, okay, here's your options. You can do a military challenge against me, and I can block with Corrin and kill one of your characters. Mm -hmm. Or you can not declare a military attack and discard a card from your hand. Or you can <laughs> declare a military attack that has enough strength to get over Corrin, and then I'll watch her on the wall with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I get two power at the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> I get two power at the end of this. Yeah, so... Uh... A lot of negative decisions. Um, <laughs> it's a lose, lose, lose. NPE much? NPE? <laughs> <laughs> hey. Hey. I'm immune to that now. I've heard that shit so much. I don't nah. even care. No, nah, no. Nah, I think it's fair. I think it's it's a good card. And like I said, I really like what they're going with that one. All jokes aside, um, I'm, I'm happy that Night's Watch is getting good cards. Playable cards. Uh, and I don't think at any point... The Night's Watch has been really unstoppable or like taking over the meta or anything like that. Uh, I think it's pretty balanced, to be completely honest. I actually I actually did a little bit of data evaluation based on the Annals of Castle Black stuff. They're really good at making the cut, but once they're in the cut, they don't do all that well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's balanced in that like they're they're good against bad decks, decent against good decks. That's 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 how I characterize them, and and obviously you're gonna feel really shitty if you lose to it and you're playing a bad deck, mm -hmm. uh, because you're already playing a bad deck. So that's strike one. And then you're losing to Night's Watch, who used to be the joke of the game. That's yep. strike two, and then the person's laughing at you. Which is <laughs> <great>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean that's fair. I totally agree with that too. Like as good as they are getting, you don't see them just going in and, and sweeping tournaments. So they're not Lannistering it up. Yeah. So I still think that yeah. it's, it's pretty balanced. They're not qualifying at 33% and winning at 28%. They're still right around 10 at each. So That's fair. They're balanced, guys. And Greyjoy is right hate, under that? You may hate playing against them, but they're not overpowered. That's, that's fair. Great. I think I, I read your post about that, and I, I can't remember where Greyjoy ranked in that. I think it was like they might have been they, third. They were, they were positive in both respects. They were good at getting to the cut, and then they were perform they perform well in the cut. So mm -hmm. Greyjoy is in a pretty good place right now. I think that has something to say about the people that are piloting these Greyjoy decks. We're just a superior <laughs> superior <laughs> class of gamers. But you don't think Valar has, has made them tier one? No, that we definitely benefited from that a lot. Yeah. Uh, that definitely has something to do with it, I would say. <clears throat> I gotta turn my lights on. It's getting really dark in here. Yeah, no worries. As you do that, I'll just switch over to the next card. So as Joe is turning his lights on, we've got uh, the two-cost location called Fist of the First Men. It is the North trait and also non-loyal. While your reserve value is higher than an opponent's, each ranger character you control gets plus one strength and cannot be bypassed by stealth. So... Immediate synergy, uh, Joe, as you can make it back here. I already read the card off. And uh, so very immediate synergy that we see here with this card. And Corrin, because now with the Fist of the First Men out, if you are able to have your reserve higher than your opponents, you know that Corrin's going to have six strength. And you can no longer bypass him by stealth. So as Joe was saying, um, you're going to be less likely to throw, your, throw yourself into military challenges on offense that you can't necessarily win but at the same time not attacking doesn't mean that his ability won't pop off because if you don't attack and the night's watch player decides to throw themselves in on attack with him and has a way to weasel out and you know win that challenge two characters are dying unless you yeah. just have all uniques out so i think that this is this is a good card but do you think that it can fit into well into your deck space right now no I, I honestly, I, I, uh, I just posted my review of the entire cycle uh, for Night's Watch this morning, and I ranked it as the worst card that we got this cycle. Because, first of all, you already have a card that does this mm -hmm. in Benjen, and it does it better because there's no conditions at all. Mm -hmm. It's just play Benjen, you get this effect. Uh, secondly, you, you, getting reserve that's higher than your opponent's deck isn't guaranteed. I mean, for example, 
how many decks do you see running Time of Plenty? And how many decks do you see running, uh, you know, Counting Coppers? Mm -hmm. Those two plots are in a lot of decks. So if those two plots... Assume, assuming that most decks run t those two plots or a large number of decks run those two plots, you're probably not getting more renown than them on those turns. Reserve, reserve. Sorry, more re reserve on those turns. And then in addition, Saltman's building orders, they're both seven. You're probably not beating them on those turns. Mm -hmm. So really, and then, you know, so you can build your plot deck to get higher reserve, but this effect doesn't necessarily make it worth it because you already have Benjen that does this anyway. So I don't think I'm going to play it. It's mm -hmm. a lot of hurdles to jump through. Like if anyone, anyone who's played a Night Gathers deck before knows uh, getting higher reserve, because this is higher, not higher than or equal to. It's mm -hmm. higher. Higher than your opponent is actually pretty difficult, and, and it can really ruin a turn if you were planning on doing a Night Gathers and you didn't get it because they happen to play their Counting Coppers that turn. Something like that. So uh, I don't think I'm going to run this card right now. If more reserve effects come around that make it worth my while to build my plot deck to win renown reserve, I might consider it. But for the time being, I, I, I don't think it's worth it, especially compared to Haunted Forest and Castle Black, which are also oh, two gold. Yeah. And they're so much better than this location. Yep. Haunted Forest. <laughs> uh, the only game you started on that one. <laughs> on that note, let's move on to Baratheon. Nice. <laughs> So, Salador San, 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 however you want to pronounce it. Uh, I think this one's you, Joe. Oh, okay. Uh, Salador San, four cost character, uh, military intrigue icons, unique, non loyal to Baratheon. Three strength, he's a mercenary, a raider, and a smuggler. Reaction, after you win a challenge in which Salador San is participating, put a warship location or weapon attachment into play from your hand. What do you think? So this is a card that when it first got spoiled, um, there was a lot of excitement, especially for obviously being able to splash it into Greyjoy. Because if you look at his, his traits, the mercenary trait, the raider trait, smuggler not so much, but the mercenary and raider are um, things that we see a lot of in Greyjoy. And the fact that it specifies being able to play a warship location uh, into play from your hand is also something else that made Greyjoy players or just players in general think of the immediate synergies between this card and Greyjoy decks. Now, I've had the opportunity to play test with it, and in my opinion, the Greyjoy Kraken decks that try to include this card are still going to lose out to. Sorry, were you trying to say something, Joe? I can't hear you. Greyjoy Stag, right? Sorry, Greyjoy Stag, yeah. Greyjoy Stag. So, uh, decks that try to play in this with this card, I think, are still going to lose out to um, a lot of the other Greyjoy tech decks and tech in terms of power level. Because at the end of the day, you still need to draw the warship. That's the one thing. So you're going to have to pack your deck full of them. And I think currently, that's not really what the Greyjoy players want to do. So you're gonna have to pack your deck full of them and then you're gonna have to win a challenge with Salador in it just to get that warship or weapon out. So, I mean, it would be nice if you could win a challenge with him, a military challenge and throw down a throwing ax or win the challenge and get a free Great Kraken or a free raiding longship or whatever have you, uh, as in like a, a boost to your econ. But it just takes too much, I found, and there was just so many other things that I would prefer to do with my time and with my money in the game than trying to rely on and hold back cards that I need to win just to pop his ability off and play them in the challenges phase. So I would rather just pay the two straight up in the challenges phase and get my rating longship out and start removing characters than praying that, you know, they don't do some tricky business that's going to screw me over from popping off his ability because one treachery and that's out the door. Yeah, so... Uh, I just looked up the warships. There's five of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the the Great Crack and Iron Fleet Scout, Raiding Longship, Sea Bitch, and the Valyrian. So there's only there's only five, and the only one that has a reaction to winning a challenge is the Great Kraken. Great Kraken. Yep. And that has to be unopposed. So uh, the only time you're getting an immediate benefit out of his ability to drop a warship is when he's he's winning an unopposed challenge. Uh, 
sounds kind of win more to me. Yeah. Uh, now, granted, you can use weapons too. Uh, you can drop what is that one card in? Um, iron, uh, iron axe or yeah, throwing axe. Throwing axe. You what? can drop a throwing axe into play after you win a challenge, but I mean, then you'd have to actually run them, which nobody does. <laughs> Uh, yep. So you're you're already adjusting your deck for this guy. I mean, if if that were a viable strategy, those little guys that let you ambush in the raiders, weapons, yeah, yeah, the raiders from Pike would have been a good card. And I know in your last video you were talking about them, but you were joking. Yeah, they're fucking <laughs> awful. So. <laughs> uh. <laughs> You were joking, and you were misleading new players who didn't know that you were joking, <laughs> which I feel very irresponsible. Hey, I got it to pop off one time, and it was <laughs> awesome. It was the best thing ever. So if that is viable, like if that card is not viable, I don't see how this card is viable. That actually requires you to win a challenge with him yeah. before you can do it. Um, and then, and then obviously the the problem is uh, you can use banner cards, or you can use you can banner him in and use your loyal cards like ice. You can do with ice. That's really the only good use I've come up with for yeah. this guy is, is dropping in ice. Because nobody's so. dropping in King Robert's Warhammer. Trash. <laughs> so trash. Trash, trash, trash. No one's doing that. Uh, and true. even with ice, I mean, I, I thought of that as well with the Stark, um, Stark Stag. And that would be nice. Not so much to rely on that to pop the kill off. Uh, more so to get ice in for free and save yourself three dollars that you can spend on something else. But again, in doing so, you're really relying on Salador winning a challenge. And you know there are times when yes, you can pretty much guarantee that you're going to get that challenge off, but you cannot guarantee that you're going to get that reaction off. Is what yeah. the problem is. Uh, so I thought he would be a lot more fun, fun to play, or a lot more. Sorry, I thought he'd be a lot more useful. He is still fun to play but I don't think he is the most competitive. Well, let me compare him to uh, Elena, King of Th King of Queen of Thorns. I mean, that lets you drop out a character when you win a challenge with her. And that's... Um, that. I mean, that's, that's half your deck. Mm -hmm. Over half your deck most of the time. Warships and weapons, that's maybe a tenth of your deck. Mm -hmm. And people don't really play Queen of Thorns just because she's too expensive, first of all, and then second of all, her reaction is just not all that reliable, so... If that's not going to see play, I don't, I don't know how this does, but it's it's interesting. It's yeah. it's fun. It's definitely an interesting playstyle. They're definitely shipping Baratheon and Greyjoy, mm -hmm. so it's at least it's at least a new thing that they're doing uh, to keep things different and encourage creative deck building. So I appreciate that. Yeah, but again, it's very limited, and it probably wouldn't see play unless it's in a banner deck, because as far as I know, Baratheon doesn't have any warships of their own, and their weapon attachments. They've got they one, have, one. They have one warship. Oh, they do. Oh, yeah. Sorry, the next one. Obviously, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about stuff that you know we haven't covered yet. But now we will. So we're up onto the Valyrian. Uh, I do the saltation. So, <laughs> one cost location, the the Valyrian. It is obviously non loyal because they want you to throw it into Greyjoy. They freaking blatantly tell you this pretty much. Ambush of two, but you're not supposed to ambush it. Action, kneel the Valyrian to give an attacking character plus X strength until the end of the challenge. X is the number of gold in the defending player's gold pool. Uh, so that's a bookmark. Um, you're not going to play this card <laughs> ever. <laughs> ever. Until there's a card that says, when you win a challenge, give your opponent gold. <laughs> this card won't get played. Because you can't, again, guarantee that someone's going to sit back on like five gold. And then you're going to throw in a plus five. Even if it's one gold they're sitting on, you get the plus one. Who cares at that point, I think. It's not worth yeah. wasting a deck spot on this card, in my opinion. I, re I remember when this card was first spoiled, uh, and me and my brother and a couple of my friends were still doing our podcast. Uh, basically, my podcast, the, the three other people have since quit the game. So I don't really have a podcast anymore. Is that because uh, of you <laughs> playing Night's Watch? NPE, NPE? <laughs> It's all my fault. No, but I remember when this card was first spoiled. We spoiled it. We talked about it on my podcast, and uh, my brother made a funny point. He was just like, "What? What? What is this supposed to be? Is this supposed to be a counter to Cortarian? Like, oh, you win an, you you initiate an intrigue challenge and gain two gold. You're gonna regret that." <laughs> it's just like, who fucking cares? I mean, even if you have this card out, they're still gonna want the gold. Yep. If they if they were gonna have gold, they're not gonna not want to have gold because of this card. 
so I, I, it might have it, it could have application, but mm-hmm. if they're saving two gold, that's an unusual turn in my opinion. <laughs> Don't you agree? I like agree. it's it's usually one gold or no gold. People mm-hmm. unless you're unless you're Lannister, people are going in with zero or one gold in the challenge phase, maybe sixty seventy percent of the time. Mm-hmm. So saving two gold, saving three gold, is uh, relatively unique but to thing, Lannister. Though, it says until the end of the challenge. So say your opponent was saving two, they go into the challenge and you block it, I don't know, five. It has to be more. So you block it like seven to two or whatever. You kneel this, so now you're up to seven, four. Sorry. That's not a good example. Nine four. I say nine four, right? Nine, nine four. Whatever, whatever the case is, and then they now play an event using that gold. The challenge is still not over, so you immediately drop in strength, and they can still do what it is they want to do. So as soon as that gold gets spent, because it's until the end of the challenge and it's not you know forever at this point, no matter what they do in between challenge being initiated and the end, your strength can still fluctuate, which makes this card garbage to me. And it's also only attacking character, so it's not you can't even use it on defense. Oh, sorry. So it's, there you go. So it's in, it's inflexible when you can wow. use it. You can only use it on attacking. So so here's the thing, I play Night's Watch, right? Um, do people you? generally? You play Night's Watch. I do. Watch? Okay. On occasion, I do. Yeah. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure. Uh, I've learned people don't really declare challenges that they don't that they intend to lose. I mean, unless unless it's a Lord of the Crossing deck. If they're declaring a challenge, there's a good chance that they're trying to win that challenge. Mm-hmm. So if they're going in with less strength than they need to win, and you declare this, and then they, they get plus one strength or plus two strength, it just doesn't seem like a big deal to me. Okay, wait. I mean, sorry sorry to interrupt you. So a question here. So yeah. same example as I was saying before. So say you're winning this challenge, and you're winning it, uh, let's say, seven to two because seven. of this. And then you go to pop out, put to the sword. You're now unable to put to the sword because you've spent the... No, wait. Sorry, it's their goal. Not no, yours. it's their goal. Okay, okay, okay. Good. Never mind. We're good. We're good. It's decent then. And and, and once once the once the strength buff is applied, it doesn't matter if they spend the gold. Because when you kneel it, that's when oh, the strength goes okay, on. Okay, so it's plus X till the end of the phase and it stays at that. It's yeah, X is the number okay. in there. That is, that is a little confusingly worded, though. Because I thought it would just... X is gone. X is, X is the, the number of gold. gold in the defending player's gold. So I think it, I think it happens at the like, when you commit the action, it locks in the number because it would be pretty ridiculous if it was like, oh, well, I'll spend four gold and take four strength weight. That'd be silly. So I don't know. I'm I, gonna... I would like to to know. <laughs> Actually, no. The the rules FAQ on my screen says the X is fixed at the moment you use the ability. So you're right, and will not yeah. change the defending player subsequently subsequently spends gold. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. That makes it a little bit better. So, sorry uh, guys. It's not a bad card. It's not a horrible card, but it's not like, it's not a counter to Tyrion core. Right. It's not. It's not going to make your opponent not want to have gold in the challenges phase. If they mm-hmm. if they wanted gold, they're going to still use it. Mm-hmm. It's not a deterrent. It's just a a, a a a predictable strength buff. That's dependent on what your opponent is doing. I think it's bad. Uh, one pretty good thing that it does is if you're reading a book and you have to put it down for a second, you can put it on the page <laughs> so that when you close the book, you'll know exactly where you are when you open it again. <laughs> and you've got three of them. Nice. You three books three, on the go. Three bookmarks <laughs> for yeah. all those Game of Thrones books you're reading. So Salador and the Valyrian are pretty meh right now. Very underwhelming for Brathian. Brathian players must be very sad. But they're at the beginning of an interesting theme that could develop further. We'll see. That is right. So, on to Lannister. Let's see if they got some juicy cards. Lannister. Uh, Podrick Payne. He's a unique, non-loyal Lannister character. Three gold. Military and power icons. One strength. He's got the companion trait. Interrupt. When a character would be killed for military claim, pay two gold and put Podrick Payne into play from your hand to save it. Then... If that character was Tyrion Lannister, you may pay two more gold. It doesn't say more, but it's two more gold mm-hmm. to choose and kill an attacking character. You don't look. You is that crying or laughing? Or? That's just me nodding. 
<laughs> it's pretty it's pretty decent, man. So so FFG is like, here's a Valyrian to to save you from Tyrion. And then they put this card in like <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> you, you you do what? You you put to the sword? Okay. Here, I got well, something you, for that. You use that. You use that four gold that I had to give your guy plus four strength, <laughs> so you could win that challenge. Oh man! Well, now I'm gonna spend that four strength and murder your person. He's dead. <laughs> um, no, it. I don't think that it's unfair because it does cost a lot to get this off. You, you need to have four gold. Um. Four gold at the time of this popping off. So, I mean, how many times does Lannister have four gold in the challenge phase, right? A, a lot of the time. <laughs> but, but let's pretend that they don't. Uh, let's pretend so that they don't. Let's pretend that the only way that they get let's four gold is if two intrigue challenges happen and they have Tyrion out on the board already, and we are dumb enough to pop off an intrigue to give them that third and fourth gold to get this whole ability off. The thing with this, I think, though, is that even if they don't have the full four and they just have two and are able to save Tyrion and get Pod into play, that's a win, in my opinion. Yeah. A save and a character in play that they weren't expecting in play could block a challenge, could get an unexpected, unopposed challenge on the on the return attacks. I mean, even without the second portion, he's not awful. Yeah. Uh when you add in the second part, it's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. And now I remember when this was first when this was first spoiled, people were talking about how great it was. I don't think it's great. Uh, I think it's I think it's a good one of maybe two of. If I mean, you have to run Cortirian. Without mm -hmm. Cortirian, this card is garbage. But assuming you run Cortirian, which is most Lannister decks, you know Lannister decks that don't do the clans, mm -hmm. uh, clansmen. You're going to like seeing this guy in hand. You can keep him in hand for a while because you're not going to lose many intrigue challenges as Lannister, so you can kind of keep him around, wait for the opportunity to use him. And then with Tyrion Lannister out, you could it, you don't really signal this card by having four gold because you could just have four gold just by chance with Tyrion Lannister. Mm -hmm. So it's it's hard for your opponent to predict this. It's a save, which saves are never a bad thing in this meta with Valar. You want to keep your bodyguards and your dupes and everything like that as long as possible. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think he's a good card. Uh, I don't think that he's like 3x must play or anything like that, but he's a nice little compliment to Tyrion. If you're already playing Tyrion, which you will be, there's no reason not to play this guy at 1 or 2. And I think one of the limiting factors here uh, the reason why you would only really play the one or two is because it has to be on a military claim. So if it's a target of put to the sword or if it's a tears or um, Valar turn, you can't use pod to save in that instance. So that kind of brings this card back a little bit. And if you think of a similar card like uh, Jory Castle, the reason why Jory is better and costs more than this is because of that reason. Jory can save from anything, whereas he can only save from military claim. So I think yeah. that kind of makes this card a lot more fair. Yeah. And, and you know, you can, like, the, the way you use it is you, you claim Tyrion when you normally wouldn't and then spend the gold to, to, to bring Pot out and then kill somebody. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Treachery could completely ruin that and then you just killed your Tyrion. Okay. But, uh... Just don't do this against Lannister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anybody else but them. Just yeah, do this against all the other plebs, but not not Lannister. Just save it for the mirror matches. So, save it against the mirror matches. But, uh, yeah, four gold. You could just have it by chance, or you could have it planning to do this. Saving Tyrion and killing Tywin, or saving Tyrion and killing Balin, for example, it's a pretty fucking good. It's a pretty good play for two gold. It's four good. gold. It's too so. good. It's too good. <laughs> Uh, so moving on to the next card, funny funny story before before we showed, <laughs> before we started recording this. Oh my god! I was uh, trying to get the pack image, and I made a very stupid comment, being like, "Man, I wish they had a, a card in this pack called Tyrion's Chain." It's so stupid that they wouldn't do that. And he's like, "What did you say?" I can't even remember. Like, it's funny that there's when you fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're like you're loading it up. You're like, ah, okay, chapter pack six, Tyrion's chain. Man, it's a shame they don't have a card called Tyrion's chain. Isn't that stupid? I was like, yeah, that's stupid, Shamar. It's stupid that you don't read the fucking cards you're <laughs> <trying> to do. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> so there's a card called Tyrion's Chain. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought to check the cards before they did the review of this pack? Like I said, I usually open packs, or when I look at packs, I just skip to the stuff that I want to see. So great job. <laughs> a couple plots, and then I close it up. Or like sort it away and not read anything else really. But we'll get so, Joyce then. So we've got Tyrion's Chain, a one cost event, which is loyal to Lannister, which means it's probably gonna do something interesting. <laughs> Reaction. After you win a challenge in which you control a participating unique Lannister character, which is every freaking challenge for them, choose a revealed war plot card. Initiate the when revealed ability on that plot card as if you had just revealed it, max one per phase. Eh, I think it's whatever. Um, it's it's interesting, but it's not really that good. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Just looking at them really quick, the when revealed effects for wars right now are if this will load Black Battle of Blackwater, Battle of the Blackwater, which is coming up in this chapter pack, Heads on Spikes, uh, reinforcements, and Wildfire Assault. So if you played Wildfire Assault and then you win. What is it? Uh, uh, any challenge. Uh, any, any challenge. After you win a challenge with a participating unique character, you can re-wildfire. So if you if you wildfired them and then they played three new characters because you just used your reset, mm -hmm. you can kill three characters again. Not awful. Uh, reinforcements, if you for some reason play reinforcements. <laughs> uh, you can re When revealed, you can play another five character cost character from your discard pile. Mm -hmm. Again, not awful, but when is someone using that plot? I haven't seen it in ages. I haven't seen it since like those forest decks mm -hmm. that were pre-Valor, pre-everything. So, Heads on Spikes obviously is one. great. That's the best use for it, is Heads on Spikes. I could see a, a Lannister deck running two Heads on Spikes, three, like, you know, two Tyrion's Chains, and then just waiting until they draw a Tyrion's Chain, and then they flip Heads on Spikes, do it again, and the next turn, flip Heads on Spikes, do it again. Mm -hmm. That'd be pretty cool, but it's niche. And then mm -hmm. Battle of the Blackwater is just removing dupes. Uh, might be nice if they have a super-duped character, but mm -hmm. situational? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think anyone's going to play it, but it could be fun. It could yeah. be a little fun, like, fucking around deck. Yeah, I don't think this card gets sees play uh, for a while. It's one of those cards that you kind of just sit on and wait for more stuff to get released. Because obviously, being an LCG, we know that this is going to go on for a while. Or just being a card game in general, we know that more stuff is going to come out. There's going to be a little bit of power creep. So we're going to see some more plots that actually come out and do some pretty substantial things. And at that point is when we're going to hate that Tyrion's Chain was already released, I think. Well, was it released though? Well, apparently. Does this card exist? It's news to Does me. <laughs> Who knew they put cards in that match the damn title of the pack? Yeah, where's the my hell? cult arm card? <laughs> cult arms? Where's that card? Ah, uh, what, whatever. Inconsistent whatever. over this, here. This pack should have just been called Esgrid, in my opinion. Because <laughs> here she is. Speaking of her, Esgrid. Yeah. Um, five yeah. cost. Non-loyal, unique, all three icons, two strength, stealth with the Ironborn trait. If you control Asha Greyjoy, sacrifice Esgrid and have your Asha Greyjoy gain one power. And Esgrid may by bypass an additional character using stealth. <laughs> <laughs> You're a fan. Yeah, um, I like it. I think it's very useful. Um... My issue with this card, so everyone knows what this card does. Everyone knows why this card is going to be uh, a useful card for Greyjoy. Um, the stealth intrigue is godlike. I love it. Uh, it opens up new avenues, so now we can get some Greyjoy reigns going. My, it's not an issue with this card, but my thing with this card is <clears throat> it seems that people are still trying to find a balance as to whether or not you run all of one and none of the other. So like three copies of her and zero core Asha or do you run two and one one and two uh finding the ratio and I think in my opinion I don't necessarily agree with playing both of them um I think for me I'm just gonna stick to my guns and really just go all in on one or the other why that is I don't really have any concrete or specific reasons other than the fact that I don't want to ever pull one and feel like I really, really need the other.
because Asha's ability, Corset Asha, obviously they don't even have the same name. So Asha's ability versus hers. Um, yeah, you can only self one character, but being able to stand after an unopposed is obviously very strong. However, we know that things like Haunted Forest do exist. So getting her to stand after or use her reaction after an unopposed challenge doesn't happen as often as we'd like it to. So mm -hmm. there are things like treachery, um, a million things that, that can be done to her to stop her from procking that ability versus Esgrid here. She has nothing that can be stopped from treachery. She doesn't care if it's unopposed or not. She's just stealthing two characters and helping you push through a challenge. So I think it depends which way your deck is going. Obviously, yes, she can help you get uh, that unopposed to pop off other things like Great Kraken or whatever have you. But I really think for me, it's it's one or the other. So here's my big issue with this card. And um, it doesn't really see play right now, but it's something that's definitely worth considering. Um, first of all, Venomous Blade kills this card, mm -hmm. which no one plays that card right now because it's just too expensive. But if the time comes and it starts being played, you obviously are going to are gonna struggle with this card. Oh, do you want to see uh, what that does? Sorry, so everyone knows. Yeah, go for it. No, do you, you're looking at it right now, right? Just, oh, just yeah, read. I have to go back to it. Shit. Fuck, oh, man. It takes so long. Well, I was... Oh, no. Oh, it lost my search. Oh, God. So so bad, Joe. Come on. I, I'm, I'm bad. I'm terrible at this it's stuff. Supposed to, it's supposed to be on the ball Okay. Here. So, <laughs> supposed to make up for you, right? Um, let's see here. Okay. Uh, Venomous Blade is a Martell attachment. Ambush 3, cost 3. Attached character gets plus 1 strength. And reaction after Venomous play, Venice Blade enters play. Place a to poison token on a character with printed strength 2 or lower. And then uh, also there is... Let's see here. There's um, Grey Wind, who when Rob's out, he can just devour yep. as grid. <clears throat> um, Quaith of the Shadow can remove her from challenge because it's strength 2 or lower. Uh, so there's, and then, uh, the Baratheon, a shy priestess mm -hmm. can just kneel him, kneel her. Plaza of Punishment. So, Plaza of Punishment can kill her. So she's got, there's, there's plenty of weaknesses to these low strength characters mm -hmm. in the game already. Almost every faction has one of them that, oh, um, um, obviously he can already kill Asha, but, oh, no, never mind. For, forget what, forget to say anything. Uh, I was talking about. Uh, Corin, but it's not unique only. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, there's 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 a good amount of characters that that counter this. Uh, even even Wolves of the North, Arya Stark can choose and kill a character with strength three or lower. Even the known plays her. It's still there. So I I hate her strength, but her ability is obviously extremely strong. Mm -hmm. The fact that she's a Tricon. I mean, you're you're probably getting an unopposed challenge with this character unless they also have stealth, because you're stealthing two people with this character. Maybe one more with Theon, you know, it, it, it'll work. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be good. I mean, how many times do people try and put a little bird or a, a, pointed, a pointed on their Asha? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think she's great. Yeah. And, and as for the thing about how many of each to run, I've seen people say two and one, two Asha, one Esgrid. Uh, I think you could do two and two because you're not limited, by, you're not limited to three because they're different titles. Mm-hmm. So you can have two and two if you want. It all depends on what your deck's trying to do. I think this card is better in the um, Greyjoy Reigns of Castamir. Because you, you're you obviously going to be easier getting an Intrigue of plus five when you're stealthing two people in an Intrigue challenge. Oh, yeah. So uh, I think this it's it's a good card. It has its weaknesses, but it has its good card. It's called balance. <laughs> it is. It's, 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 it's good. Ba I think it's good balance. And also, I think that this card is... Um, a very good utility card for people that are trying to bring the Greyjoy package as a banner um, because in one card you're now popping off two stealths so if you're one of those players who are bringing Greyjoy into other things like a Targ, Kraken or or uh, the most popular is the Lanny Crack Index um, mm -hmm. this is a very utility card for you in helping you to have your way with your opponent because yeah. she's taking two characters out pretty effectively um, yeah. and pretty reliably as well. So 
I don't know. I, I do like it. I think that uh, it's an uh, interesting design as well. And yeah. It's uh, one of the few cards that Greyjoy got this cycle that I'm, I, th- I said, like, oh, wow, that'll see play. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one of, like, three. I think three or four. Is that right? Yeah. What are the Greyjoy cards this cycle? Uh, well, two of them are these two. Those ones are actually useful. Yeah, these two are useful. Um, you got Bless him, bless him with Salt? Yeah. That's a great card. Uh, it's probably uh, your favorite card, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, terrible. Oh, my God. We've gotten some very, very bad cards. Not even just this cycle, just in general, in all the releases. Like, so many cards that are just trash. I wouldn't even use that as a bookmark. <laughs> You're ashamed to look at it. There are so many. Aaron Damper is pretty good. Have you played with him at all? No, because I think that he's not ready yet either. Oh. And it's a Valar just... is pretty good, right? I mean, oh, you can save him, but you're just going to get an ult anyway. Yeah, it, but it... it's too too <coughs> gimmicky. Like, all yeah, the cards that we got are just so gimmicky. Win a, win a challenge by whatever with this guy participating by himself to steal a location. That is fantastic. Oh, that For seven? Oh, my God. What a deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So as good, good. As good, good. Next card. Oh, I wish we had Jesse Pinkman on. Bitch. Bitch. <laughs> bitch. <laughs> so C bitch, which I'm still surprised that they they printed it as such. I thought they would change the name to make this more friendly. FFG is an adult company, yo. That I guess that's true. Uh, so one one cost it's a warship and it's non-loyal it's called sea bitch just think of jesse pinkman from uh breaking bad saying the sea bitch 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 (laughs) action sacrifice sea bitch to choose a non-limited location take control of that location until the end of the phase and then call your opponent a bitch (laughs) i'm taking your wall bitch I'm taking it and I'm doing stuff with it, bitch. <laughs> All right, I, I, the first thing I want to talk about is this is one of the most Nedley cards I've ever seen. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, Nedley is when the card's text matches the the story of the card. Uh, so, spoiler alert for like the second book that was released 15 years ago. <laughs> but uh, uh, Theon, you know, he goes back to talk to his father. And his father convinces him to raid, like you know, uh, help him raiding the coasts of of the north while while Rob is away out of outside Winterfell, marching on the Lannisters and everything like that. And he has the the, <laughs> the ship Sea Bitch. And he was told by his his dad, like, oh, just raid little villages. Don't do anything crazy. Theon, don't do anything crazy now. <laughs> hey Theon, don't do anything crazy now. Don't do Theon, don't do anything crazy. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to fucking take over Winterfell. And so he goes to Winterfell, and he he kind of just he get he's he gets his way in, and takes it over. <laughs> then the Boltons quickly come and take it away from him, and then totally fuck him up. <laughs> and and he lost his ship. He's he's now he's he's screwed. He's like he's ruined for like three straight books. Mm-hmm. He is trash. He's nothing. And and that matches his card so perfectly. <laughs> he loses his ship, sacrifice sea bitch, to gain a non limited location for one turn before it's taken back from the person <laughs> that he took it from. I mean it's so perfect. It is one of the most deadly cards I've ever seen, ever, and it just makes me happy. But uh, in terms of the game balance Annoying as all hell. Yep. I mean, the way the timing works, uh, he you keep the location until the end of the phase. So the wall, it interrupts when the phase ends. So for those of you who are are are, are don't know this, it's it's when until and at. That's the order in which things resolve. When the challenge phases end, do this. Until the challenge phase ends, do this. At the end of the challenge, at the end of the phase, do this. That's the order in which they resolve. So the wall resolves when the challenge phase ends. This resolves until the end of the phase. So when the wall triggers, the Greyjoy player still has control of the wall, and then immediately goes back to the Night's Watch player after it's already been triggered. So you 
if you use this to take the wall from the Night's Watch player, they lose their strength buff for the challenges phase. They don't get the power, even if they didn't allow any unopposed challenges. And they don't get it back until the, the following phase, in which case it doesn't do anything for them. So it's really irritating, but undeniably, undeniably an amazing card. Mm -hmm. uh, this card has so many uses. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is that because of this card, nobody will ever play Dagmar Clefjaw. Why would I pay seven to do this <laughs> when I could pay one to do this? Even though it's for one turn, I'd rather play one versus seven and not have to win a challenge by myself with a guy that doesn't even have stealth or anything like that. Uh, so that alone is great. The fact that this is you're paying one to buff Drowned Men until you sacrifice it. So Drowned Men immediately uh, receive a bonus off of that. And then, as Joe said, you're able to disrupt your opponent's deck. Um, the thing with stealing the wall is you're not necessarily stealing it so that you can gain that two power, although it would be nice if you were able to. You're stealing it to deny your opponent two free power from, you know, sitting behind three haunted forests and just looking at you. And it's, <laughs> and it's, it's kind of a mindfuck, right? Because... If they're going first, and you have Sea Bitch and they have the wall, then they're like, uh, should I attack? Because if I attack, like, if he, if I, if I defend all the challenges, he'll just take my wall and then gain the power for himself. Or, I can just attack, and then don't, I won't defend this round, but then I don't get the wall, and he'll just wait till next turn to sacrifice and take it. So, you're losing two power from the wall whenever this card comes out of play, because you can do it any time in the challenge in the challenges phase. So even if I defend all three challenges and I didn't like it doesn't help me at all. I pa I'm first player, I have to pass challenges to get the wall, and then I have to kneel all my characters to defend the wall. Then you're like, oh okay, uh okay, end of challenges. I'll do an action, take the wall, get the two power, here's your wall back. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the two power. So it's a four power swing for one gold against Night's Watch players. Not bad. Uh, against Baratheon players, you can take the Red Keep, and then it's a four-card swing for one gold. Uh, very significant. I mean, you're talking about pretty crazy swings in terms of power and card draw and what, what have you. And then the funniest part of this card is, uh, you know, I've seen on occasion that, that uh, 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 Lions of Castor Rock Circe, the, the big one, the Queen Circe that, that doesn't kneel to do intrigue challenges i've seen decks that do like castle rock small council chamber and everything like that to do two intrigue challenges and get power from them and put it on the small council chamber see bitch you just take the, the small council chamber and if that get if that gets you to 15 you win <laughs> so <laughs> tim tim i hope you're watching that nonsense that you do see bitch yes <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you you just you let them build power on the on the small council chamber because they think it it can't be you know we not so because it's immune to events right mm -hmm. so you they think they're immune and you're like ha 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 and then you're just like okay one gold see bitch I'll take that and uh, okay I had eleven power before <laughs> I have four power oh I win for one gold is that fantastic I like this card this is a pretty good card yeah so like can you can you count that to confirm that I, that I just hit 15 with your power please can you can you do that for me I might I might be miscounting how much power do I have right now including yours how much do I have I, I have 15 I have 15 okay I, I win <laughs> yes I love it it's it's perfect the name is perfect the deadliness is perfect and the use of it is perfect. I, I think this is one that, you know, not very often are cards released where you know 100% you're going to throw it in and it's going to have uses against no matter what matchup you're, is that you're playing. There are so many non-limited locations in the game that you're always going to have a target for Sea Bitch and it's going to disrupt your opponent. Don't get hung up on the fact that you have to sacrifice it and it's only that one turn because that one turn could win you, the game, win you the game either that turn or in the long run. Not yeah. to mention having another copy or another two copies of this in your deck. Uh, you never really know what, what it's going to do for you. I'd run three no matter what. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't see any reason not to. I mean, it's one cost, so it's great on setup. And if they don't have any locations to steal, fine. Who 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 cares at all? It's still a warship. It's still powering up your drowned men. Uh, King Baloney can kneel it, I think, right? Mm. Isn't it? What is... What is baloney kneel? But you don't have to kneel this. 
I know that. I'm saying uh, the king. He uh, kneels a great joy location to give each loyal character oh, control plus one strength. So if you choose to run King Baloney, uh, this is something to kneel. I don't know. I, I, I think that you'd run three no matter what. Did you just mention the other Balin? <laughs> no, no other Balin exists to me right now. That card is not even hey, in the game as far as I'm concerned. You might still be addicted to the all unopposed all the time deck. But some Greyjoy players are enterprising. Who? And King Balone. <laughs> Who? Who? Did you notice when you said King King Baloney, I was like, "Who? Who the hell is that?" I, don't, I, I know no such name. Who is that? Don't ever mention that guy on my channel ever again. <laughs> well, we, re we reviewed him in the last video. Oh God, it was so bad. Like that card's terrible. That, nothing's ever bring that back from the grave. We need like another three years in this game before that sees any use to me. If you say so. I think non kneeling attacks are not, are not bad. You're the one that hates it. So bad. So bad. <laughs> I guess if he has the stealth and whatnot, even still, terrible. Even All right. Still Let's move on. We've, we spent a lot of time on that card because it's so good. It's the fun card. All right. Is it my turn? That is you. All think. right. Quaith of the Shadows. Uh, unique, non loyal Targaryen character. Military and intrigue icons. Two strength. Ambush 3, reaction, after Quaith of the Shadow enters play during a challenge, remove each character with strength 2 or lower from the challenge. Mm -hmm. Anything to say about that? No, other than the fact that if they somehow afford to throw this in during a challenge with Esgrid, then it kind of sucks. But that's really about it. Yeah. I didn't I didn't really have a reaction to it. The The only thing I could think of was like... If they have three gold and I think they're saving it for blood of my blood, and then they end up saving it for this, and I just defended a military challenge with old forest hunter, some shit like that. And I was just like, oh, yeah, chump kneel with this, and then I do this, and then it kneels my haunted forest, and I'm like, damn. <laughs> I don't know. I <laughs> think one strength in my challenge. If they spend, yeah, if they spend three gold for that, then uh, I'd be like, okay. More power to. Cool. Let's move on to the next challenge, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very very underwhelming card. Uh, I'm sure someone will run it, but whether or not it's going to be something game changing, I highly doubt that. Uh, I don't know. It's uh, it, from a strict from a strict icon cost and strength perspective, it's not bad. Two for two with two icons. That's about. I mean, that's fine. I mean, mm -hmm. you could put in one and then. <sighs> maybe maybe at some point during the game ambushing her in will help you win a key challenge you know mm -hmm. I don't know I, challenge math should never be underestimated and I, I think that removing two strength unexpectedly or removing four strength unexpectedly from a challenge can swing a game in the right circumstances but it's very circumstantial mm -hmm. so I'd run I'd, I'd try it out at one see if I like it but it's just a, a, a mech card, really. Yeah, just just watch out for that start player that defends everything with three Tumblestone Knights. I know. If they do, I mean, oh. Godlike. Godlike. <laughs> Please nerf. Errata. Uh, next card, House of the Undying. Mm -hmm. I like the art on this. House of the Undying. <laughs> and this, this brings me back to the first edition. Uh, six cost location, which is loyal to Targaryen. The trait is Karth. And challenges action. Remove House of the Undying from the game to choose an opponent. Put each character in that player's dead pile into play under your control. At the end of the phase, return each of those cards to its owner's dead pile. Cannot be saved. So the reason why I say this reminds me of first edition is because in first edition there were a bunch of hill cards like Visenya's Hill. Probably the wrong hill. Other hills. I think it's Aegon's Hill? Is yeah, that's it. One? Aegon's Hill. Visenya's Hill didn't really do anything that I remember. That was great. But uh, Aegon's Hill. So people would play decks that literally had no characters in them. And they would just sit there, block challenges, play cards to kill people, take stuff off the board, wait till you have this massive board, Valar you, then use the hill to bring back all of your characters, do shenanigans with it, screw you over, then keep recycling that. Uh, so in this game, though, that is very unlikely to happen because of how expensive this card is at six. But at this point, like I said, there's not really much to combo this with. The only thing I can think of is 
making this or putting this into like the uh the heavy kill like lannister targ decks and then at that point it would just be a win more because you already wiped their board now you're just gonna take all the characters and have this board of like 15 characters and i guess maybe try to renown for the win so i don't think that this is going to see much play as it stands uh but i'm definitely interested to see somebody come up with a way to make this a very reliable card okay so so i'm just looking at the first edition cards uh Rainus is hill Rainus hill that's the that's the analog to this. Neo and discard Rainus Hill from play to put all characters in a single yeah. opponent. Da, 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 da. Vizinia's Hill moves a car a character card in any discard pile to a dead pile. And Aegon's Hill, you look at your opponent's hand and you may put a character card in that hand into their own their opponent's the into their dead pile. So yeah. I could see how that deck could work if you just have those three locations out and you're just looking at their hand each turn, putting characters in their dead pile. When they discard characters, moving into the dead pile, and then at some point popping this off and taking all of those characters and winning in one round. Uh, it was super okay. cheesy. It was super it's cheesy. cheesy. It sounds cheesy as fuck. <laughs> but was. apparently it worked. I, I, I don't know. I don't know the, the the meta or the culture behind the first edition game, so I don't. I can't really comment on it. But it sounds fun. There was that. There was towards the end of the of the game's life cycle. They had a couple decks where it's just very character light. Like you'd put five characters in. Uh, Martell had a variant. Greyjoy had one because they would just use a warship as a character that just did everything. It was unbelievable. <laughs> um, so yeah, I- I'm glad that they're they're trying their best to limit that by having this at six gold. Um, but nah, interesting new spin on it for people that like to just deck build fun things. Someone posted a question about this card on Facebook, and. Uh... <laughs> they're so like what do you think what do you think of this card and somebody i forget i, I don't know who they were but somebody replied treachery yeah. that was the word <laughs> yeah. that they said in response and that one word comment had like 90 replies <laughs> and it was it was the guy that started the thread and the guy that made the comment arguing about whether it's a valid argument strategy to just say one word <laughs> that counts it as a way to invalidate the card uh so Treachery. That would really suck. That's that's my response to it. <laughs> and then and then you also have Sea Bitch. So it's just like if you have this card, you better trigger that shit fast. Mm-hmm. Because once Greyjoy gets their hands on a Sea Bitch, they'll just take this card, sacrifice it, put all your characters into play. You have to use it before they use it. Mm-hmm. The, before they use the Sea Bitch. So it's kinda like shit, man. That's two cards to counter it. Yeah. <laughs> and they're each one gold. This two costs six. Very good one gold cards. So yeah, yeah, I don't know. Interesting, but will it see play? Interesting, but meh. Yeah. So if Greyjoy is first player entering the challenges phase, they get first action. Take that mm-hmm. and use it. Or you know, in treachery, obviously, there's a reaction to it. So uh, uh, it seems fun, but six cost is so expensive. It's like this is the same thing we were talking about. Roos six gold for a sacrifice, or in this case, a remove from the play card it's just really expensive for six gold you want something that sticks around man fast eddie oh wait sorry wrong house wrong house oh, yeah uh, oh, oh, oh. pay one more and get freaking the killer what's her name the killer from manila the killer that just kills stuff for no reason i hate her i hate her guts <laughs> mary uh, Ma- mary Dur- maz murderer so sir eris oakhart that's you okay sir eris oakhart he is four cost Martell, unique, non-loyal, military and power icons, three strength, no attachments except weapon. Oh, he's a king's guard and, and knight, by the way. And no attachments except weapon. Reaction: After Sir Eris Oakheart enters play, pay two gold to choose an ally character and discard it from play. What do you got? Effectively making him a six-cost character. Uh, getting rid of an ally could be nice, I suppose, but... So the allies in the game, let's, let's look that, let's look that up. Are there Card games to be game so changing convenient. allies. <clears throat> well, it's Craster. Craster is game-changing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Craster basically locks the board so that you can't, uh, Craster, I'll just read them. Uh... <clears throat> Night's Watch character 5 strength or 5 gold 4 strength intrigue icon immune to omen of uh, card effects action sacrifice craster to put each character that was killed this phase into play from its owner's dead pile 
So you can you can use Eris to sacrifice him, which discard him, which isn't bad. Uh, Jack, Jack and Hagar, if you're if you're playing that guy for some reason, you can discard him. Jack and little Jack and Jack and Hagar. <laughs> uh, <laughs> little finger is an ally. Uh, those little pissant lordship ship rights, lord support ship rights, just keep kneeling your shit. Our allies. Uh, Pyromancers are allies, so... Uh, Roos Bolton is an ally. Yeah. Uh, the Spear Maiden's an ally. So Theon's an ally. So, And then all the reducing characters are allies, I think. But I don't think you'd ever use this on a reducer. Oh, uh, yeah. If, if they only have one claim soak and you're doing a challenges phase and you got a military attack discard their only claim soak and then do a military for something valuable mm -hmm. it, uh, yeah, it's, it's conditional I think the thing that's saving this guy from being unplayable is the fact that Arion exists because it says enters play it doesn't say marshal so yeah. you can bring him into play with Arion and then only have to pay two gold to discard an ally that can be valuable if more allies come into play I mean Granted, if you're playing against Stark, or if you're playing against Lanny Wolf, and they drop Roos, and they're about to win a challenge and kill a bunch of stuff, you can just pick up Arion, put Eris Oakheart into play, pay two gold, and discard Roos. So, mm -hmm. it's not bad, but I think it's conditional. And it, and like you said, if you're just marshalling him, that's six gold for a three-strength Bicon with nothing yeah. once it enters play. I mean, it would be nice when you have the reducers out and things like that to help mitigate the cost, but... Overall, I think, again, this is a card that in the future will be strong as more allies are introduced into the card pool and become more popular into players' decks. As you listed off, there are some pretty high-value allies out there as it stands. So there yeah, is, they're decent. There's use for him, but uh, again, it's just one of those cards that you toss in a one of currently if you can yeah. fit it in and you know hope that you can pop his ability off when the time comes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. He's all right. Yeah, if if King's Guards ever become something, you could play that. But right now, the only other King's Guard is um is the is the is the the Lux box Jamie and uh the old guy. Barra. That's his name. Yeah, the the old Barra guy, Barristan. Yeah, yeah, that's his name. Those are the only other King's Guards. So that's not going to happen for a while, but. Maybe someday. Mm -hmm. Next card. This is a very easy and quick one. Yeah. <laughs> it's so quick because it's so bad. Three cost location. It's unique called the Green Blood and it's non loyal. Dorn traded. Each Martell character you control gets plus one strength for each summer plot card revealed. Cool. Yeah. You can get max two or you can get zero. You can get one. It, in Joust, in melee, you can get plus four. Yeah, so it's a melee card, of course. Game changing. Uh, but melee is not currently supported as being a competitive or official play format. Don't say that around Europeans. Yeah, they love their melee. They might shank you. <laughs> <laughs> I will stay in Canada. <laughs> but yeah, this card is just whatever. Pretty underwhelming. Don't need to spend time on that. I don't think. So we will skip to Northern Refugee. I just like to point out that for one more gold, the wall gets you basically the same strength pump all the time, and two power turn. Yeah, but so I'm just gonna leave it there. The wall is is OP and should be eroded. Hey, <laughs> okay, none of that talk. <laughs> nah, it, you're right though. Sorry, let me just. The cost was three. Like, even Winterfell. Anything else? Winterfell. In Winterfell's one more, you get that same strength buff all the time, and then you also get to cancel actions for a challenge if they're not if they don't have a winter plot. And and people will say, you know, well what if there's two summer plots in play? Mm -hmm. So oh congratulations. You got lucky. So I don't know. I think it's bad. I'm sure mm -hmm. someone will try it, but it's it's still bad. Someone will try it but it won't do anything. Yeah. Uh so you've got the next one. Alright. Northern Refugee. So we're getting into the exciting cards now. Northern Refugee is it's an ally. 
<laughs> All right, we found we found what we found Aristotle Card's purpose. Uh, Northern Refugee is a it's a non unique, non loyal, obviously it's neutral, two cost character, intrigue and power icons for one strength, ally and wildling. While there's a winter plot card revealed, reduce the cost to Marshall Northern Refugee by one. I know that's, that was my reaction too. <laughs> by one, what? By one, it's. It would be cool if it was buy one for each winter plot, so you can get it out for zero. <laughs> but either yeah, way, right. either way, it's kind of whatever. Yeah, it, it, it's <clears throat> just like House Manually Night. It's it's overwhelmingly boring. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Um, people will play it just because it's a buy con, but I mean, House Maester does basically the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have the reduce by one, but also has one more strength, and it's a maester, so you actually can do things with the maesters. Once wildlings become a thing, this will be a nice chud mm -hmm. in that deck. Basically, a reducer. It'll it'll be the equivalent. It'll take the equivalent spot of like a reducing character mm -hmm. in a wildling deck. So, yeah, I like that it has a wildling trait because then we know that you know eventually maybe you can actually, as you said, do some pretty cool things with this. So, yeah. So this card is going to be based on whatever wildlings do. If wildlings do nothing, this card does nothing. Nice. Next card. Nice. Relentless Assault. Another one with some sweet art. Yes, yeah, nice. First edition feel to that one as well. So Relentless Assault, zero cost neutral event. Reaction, after you win a challenge by five or more strength as the attacking player, kneel your faction card. Then, you may initiate an additional challenge of that type this phase. That's... I like it. Uh, lots of utility. It it does have lots of utility. Um, the first thing that comes to mind, because I'm a Night's Watch player, is I might have to deal with a fourth challenge in any given turn, and that could really fuck me over. Because if I'm dedicating like all my all my characters to defending all the challenges, say I have two Bicons and a Monocon and Castle Black, mm -hmm. I I uh, I defend three challenges but the last one I lose by five because I'm running out of characters and then they just do this and then it's a fourth challenge uh, that I can't defend and I lose the wall and it's just going to piss me off so uh, I'm happy that it's zero gold because it's easy to cancel because it's zero gold but it also is unpredictable because it's zero gold you can't you can't forecast it uh, so I don't know it, I, it's it's definitely strong mm -hmm. Uh more challenges is never a bad thing. I mean, look at uh, Cal Drogo. He's just... Cal Drogo's just like, hey, you get another military attack. Good luck with that. If you were to combo this with Cal Drogo and the plot... Uh, I, I always forget the name. That gives you Storm of Swords. Storm of Swords plus this. <laughs> just killing I'll everything. Do, I'll do a military challenge. Oh, you defended that one? I'll do a mil another military challenge. Oh, did I win? Okay, I'll play this, and I'll do another military <laughs> challenge. But not only Fuck. that, uh, one, and I wouldn't even consider this jank. This is very, very realistic, is if you are playing Corset Asha, um, and you go in on a power challenge, you win it by five, and let's say it's on a Rise of the Kraken turn, so you get that two for unopposed, she stands from her reaction, you play this and do it again. Yeah. That's a lot of power. And then not only that, but you can pop off her other challenges as well. I think this deck, this card is great in Greyjoy. I mean, this is this is this could have been a Greyjoy card because it's just so it's so great for them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I how many times and and I play a defensive deck, so I'm always defending challenges. How many times do you see in a game that doesn't have the Night's Watch, where someone does a challenge like you know they they count someone's strength. You look at your strength and you go like, okay, you have 16 strength, I'll attack for 17. And then they they just look at it like, oh, I can't stop that, so yeah. I'm just gonna I'm gonna defend for like I'm gonna let it go unopposed, or I'm gonna defend it for one guy, and you get to play this. So plus five or more when you have zero gold, a lot of people will think like, okay, no put to the sword, no put to the torch, ah, I just let it come through. I don't feel like dedicating defenders to this eight strength challenge with your with you know whatever so then you just play this and you're like okay i'll do it again mm -hmm. so i i could see this in a lot of rush decks i could see it in uh like aggro decks like we were talking about with corin uh like m you know decks that focus on military and just cutting your characters your opponent's board down i think it's good i think it's a really good card scary question scary shit. so yeah. would you put this in a fealty deck 
because you have to kneel your house card. So the the house card kneel is very. Like, you can balance entire decks around that house card kneel. I mean, mm -hmm. you can determine if a card is useful in it uh, based on how many house card kneels you already have in your deck. Even I have just one house card kneel in my in my fealty deck, Dolores Ed, and it still gets in the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll have a I'll have a Raven. It's just like ah well, you know, if I wanna if I wanna play. I said I need to keep up my faction card so I won't play this Raven. Or I'll pay two gold for my old Force Hunter, and then it's obvious that I'm holding Doris in my hand. Yeah. <laughs> so, so working around faction card kneels is very difficult, but if it's worth it, and if you don't have too many other faction card kneel cards, I, I, I think that you'd still play it. Mm -hmm. Fealty is definitely the... And, and Reigns of Castamere also. Yeah. You kind of have to pick and choose, and and while it's good with Greyjoy, uh, the fact that it covers up Seastone Chair as well could be annoying. I don't know. I don't know if Greyjoy plays still play Seastone Chair, but I haven't I had a Seastone Chair in my decks since the beginning of 2016. Really? Whoa! Wait, 2016? 2016, or like early 2016? Wow! So I think around March, April. I remember I took it out shortly after that store championship. I played it at a couple of regionals and then stopped completely because hmm. as much as I wanted it and as useful as it was, I just found that um, it's pretty easy to play around. So yeah, and now with a card like this, <clears throat> with a card like this, uh, I would probably just make my Greyjoy decks go all in on the power or even like this, this card can just do so much for so many decks so not even just a, from a Greyjoy standpoint because now I play the start Kraken and I would even throw this one in the start Kraken deck uh, and let it do work in that as well because again you can use that in the start Kraken as a power rush if that's where your opponent is forcing you or if your f opponent is forcing you to go with the military style you can still use that on the military as well and yeah. use uh, Winter's Coming to increase the claim on the second first is winter winter's coming is not once per phase it's once per challenge i believe so yeah i think so you could probably yeah. even get pop two of those off in the turn so very very useful in in any and all decks i would say yeah one max one per challenge so you can <clears throat> use two of them in two different challenges if you want yeah <sighs> yeah uh, nothing to, nothing bad to say about it it's a nice card yeah good card if you can find the spot for this event um i think it'll do uh, work for you I saw someone else point out uh, it works great with Clash of Kings. Yeah. Because you can do a power challenge. Oh, I win it. Give me two power. And then I'll play this. I'll do it again. Give me two more power. Fuck you. That's what I was thinking of uh, was Clash of Kings as well before I uh, mentioned the Rise of the Kraken. So either or, interchangeable. For those yeah. of you that can't play Rise because you're not a great boy fan, good card. Yeah. Moving on. All right. Next card. Tard Heads. <clears throat> Neutral event, one cost. Reaction. After you win a power challenge, discard one card at random from the losing opponent's hand. If that is a card is a character, place it in its owner's dead pile. Heads on spikes on a stick, basically. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much speaks for itself. Yeah. I, I, do you like it? Do you think it's going to see play? Um, I, I don't think that it's going to be a card that sees much play. Uh, it's cool that there's no other requirement other than just winning the power challenge but it also costs a dollar to do it just to discard a card so it could be cool to for the new Lannister decks where you want your opponent's hand down to zero because now yeah. you're claiming off Intrigue and you're claiming a card for power challenges as well while gaining power and potentially killing a character so it could yeah. pop off and do a lot I just think that for Lannister it'll probably be the most useful they're the ones that have the most money in the challenges phase to do things like this anyways. Uh, but for everybody else, it's kind of a whatever. Yeah, uh, that, that's basically the only thing I can think of that would use this card is the is the deluxe box Cersei decks. Because Cersei, you win an Intrigue challenge, you discard a card, you get a power. You do a power challenge, you play this, they discard a card, you get a power. It'd just be a way of... it's it's It would basically be a one-for-one, one, discard a card, gain a power card that that, like, that may as well be what it read because mm -hmm. the best part of heads on spikes is power gain i think 
That's undeniable. Putting a putting a character in an, a dead pile is nice, but a lot of times it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, when people play heads on spikes against me, I'm like, oh shit, fuck! Don't hit Benjamin! Don't hit Benjamin! Don't hit Benjamin! Oh, you got a Shadow Tower Mason. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for non uniques, like, and they they get the two power, so it's good for them. But with this card, you don't get the power. So putting a non unique character in a dead pile is basically discarding it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. <clears throat> Well, you do get it's... you get the one power for winning the challenge, so that's it's okay. But you're getting that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, but I'm just... it's not like you're not getting that if you don't play this card. It's true, it's true. But I'm just saying, there's still that little power gain and the the good feeling of watching a character go in the dead pile if it's an actual yep. useful character. Ha ha! I killed Tywin that you summoned this turn, but couldn't afford. Now that would be sweet. That would be sweet. <laughs> but it's just, uh. It's bad. I think it's a bad card. I think Cersei will like it, and that's about it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so the last card but, that I had to yeah. switch up the screen for because they changed the orientation for plots Stupid is plots. the Battle of the Black Wata. Battle of the Black Wata. Which, again, all the art in, in this pack has been pretty great. I like this one a lot so as well. Nice. Uh, did I do the last one? No. Yeah, I did. No, I didn't. No, no, okay. I did. <laughs> All right. So, Battle of the Blackwater, last card in the pack. Um, it is a neutral plot, siege and war traded plot. Yeah, siege and war traded plot. Four gold, six initiative, and one claim. When revealed, choose an opponent, discard each duplicate you control, and each duplicate controlled by that opponent from play. Uh,. It has some uses, yeah. you know. If you uh, if you run Var and um, you have if you're Greyjoy, and you don't need your dupes for saves, it's not bad. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have bodyguards and you have iron mines and you have risen from the sea, removing your <clears throat> opponent's dupes can basically make it like next turn I'm gonna Var you and you're gonna lose everything. Ah, enjoy that. Enjoy. Enjoy the misery of knowing your character's about to die next turn. In in two turns. <laughs> so please just let this game last two more turns so that I can play your characters. Please, please. <laughs> please please don't put more dupes on them before I get the chance to floor. <laughs> exactly. Um it's it's alright. I mean the stats alone are not bad. Four six one is is about uh, you're gonna win initiative most of the time with six initiative. There are some times when you won't, but yeah, six issues fine. I see Four this card fine. as more of a if you yourself, as you said, aren't playing many dupes or don't have many out, and your opponent gets lucky early and starts finding like those crappy shuffles when you just see three Tyrions, sorry, three Tywins turn one. Yeah. Uh, then yeah, that's great, but a lot of the times you don't want to get rid of your dupes as well, so. Again, if you do have the ways to save, if you do have bodyguards out and you're not worried about dupes so much, then yes. But a lot of the times, I think this is going to backfire and hit you just as hard. And then you're going to have to hope and pray that you are able to have your way with your opponent in the military phase, military yeah. challenge. Now, uh, one deck I think it'll do well in, again, is the Night's Watch Attrition deck, where all you're trying to do is just get rid of military claim. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're tears in their reducers and you're, you're coroning their reducers and you just want to get shit off the board. Mm-hmm. So if you use this, that just makes it so that they don't have any dupes to use this claim. So then you start hitting their characters faster. But it, that, it, would, be a, it would be the flip plot in that, in that deck. You run it as your seventh plot, but you could replace it with something else and you wouldn't really miss it. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that, that, that's how I would assess this card. Good, all right, in in heavy military decks, but you don't need it. You could be running something else. Yeah, and I, I hate playing that seventh plot game. I had that issue with my Stark Kraken, where my seventh was Valar, because I always assumed <laughs> that I would win by turn seven. And there were so many games where I didn't, and I was like, shit. Now I'm going to Valar myself and screw myself over big time, which is yeah. definitely a possibility with Battle of the Blackwater as well. My, uh... Uh, you know, I, I've been looking like my my plot deck for my Night's Watch deck has been, uh, 
you know, six solid plots and then one plot that's just kind of flipping between a, a couple different economy plots. It's been like, it's been trading, it's been Time of Plenty, it's been a second winter festival. And I've always been trying to like, what is the best card for this slot? One guy said like, oh, play that um, 7717 that you sacrifice a character, but then you get seven gold. Fallen seven. from favor? Fallen from favor. Yeah. Uh, he was like, oh, it's great. You're not going to want to use it all the time, but when you, like, you're going to find one turn a game where it's going to be useful. You'll have a reducer to sacrifice, and you get seven gold, seven renown, and seven, or seven, seven reserve and seven initiative. I played it for like five games, and every single time, it was my seventh plot. <laughs> and every single time it came up, it hit something that I did not want to lose. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, I, I definitely get the seventh plot game, and that might be this case with this card as well. So, Only time will tell. Only time will tell. So that is... Creative people will come up with something, I'm sure. So that is uh, Tyrion's Chain. And in your opinion, where would you rate this in this cycle in terms of uh, the cards that came out? Okay. Well, it's hard to rate an entire pack. I'd rather rank what the factions got. Mm -hmm. I think Stark got nothing mm -hmm. useful out of this pack. I think Tyrell got a really good location and a bad character. Uh... It, a meh character. It'll help you out. It's passive power gain, but it's not a deal breaker. Uh, Night's Watch got a fantastic character and a location that no one's going to play. Uh, Baratheon got <laughs> two ridiculously niche cards that could be fun, but are probably not good. Lannister got a good character, bad event. Uh, Greyjoy got the best, I think. I think mm -hmm. Greyjoy came out on top for this faction, for this, for this pack, because they got a great character, a great location and then targaryen got an awful location <laughs> and a, a meh character yeah uh and then martel who even who even cares i mean <laughs> a bad location uh a character that'll come in handy once every 10 or 15 games <laughs> and yeah. then the neutrals are the neutrals are for the most part pretty average so i would say overall it's probably a below average pack mm -hmm. just because there are more factions that didn't get really anything to help them than there were factions that got good stuff like when you look at it uh Greyjoy and Stark or Greyjoy and Night's Watch got cards that you'll play Tyrell got a card that you'll play uh Stark Targaryen Martell Baratheon Lannister for for in, in you know in some ways mm -hmm. they each got cards that you're either not going to play ever or you're only going to play a little bit in very specific scenarios so yeah. I'd say it's a relatively bad pack, but yeah. I got corn. I'm happy about that. And I got sea bitch, bitch, <laughs> bitch, and Esgrid. And Esgrid. <laughs> and relentless assault. Yeah. I mean, so, Greyjoy came out good. The relentless assault I really like, and the two Greyjoy cards I really like. I'm very happy with this pack. Uh, it's unfortunate for other players that got shitty cards, but hey, we've gotten shitty cards in lots of packs. So. <laughs> oh, Greyjoy, Greyjoy has not had a great pack this entire cycle. And Night's Watch didn't have a great pack the entire last cycle. Yeah. So th this cycle, I, I said in my review, like, if you liked the first cycle, you probably hated the second cycle and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Because all the, all, the, all the factions that got great cards like Lannister and, and, and Greyjoy got great cards in cycle one, got pretty shitty cards in cycle two. So uh, I thought I, I, I enjoyed this cycle. Mm -hmm. I thought this was a pretty good cycle. Uh, but I'm biased. And I... I, I understand that. So <laughs> people have made it very clear to me how biased I am. <laughs> it's all good, man. We all have those feelings. And I'm super excited for the next cycle, uh, the couple of spoilers that we've been able to see. And it's always just exciting to see new cards and, and kind of get an idea of which direction the game is going in. So yeah. that being said, that is our review for Tyrion's Chain and the end of cycle number two, which has a name, but I don't remember. Uh, it's... The War, of the, fi five War of the Five Kings. That's it. War of the Five Kings. I, can't, I, I don't know. I was thinking back to... First edition just sticks in my brain and messes things up. Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, now that I actually am you know, comfortable again, hopefully Joe and I are able to do this on a much more consistent basis because um, every time it is fun and it is good to be able to go over all the cards and talk about the uses of them. So before we end, Joe, do you have any plugs? Are you going to plug yourself? Well, uh, today I released the first, <laughs> the first article from my review series. Uh, Warden of the Midwest is doing the review series for all the factions. I started with Night's Watch today. On Tuesday, I'm releasing the Stark one that's written by John Herr, a local 
guy who's won a couple regionals in this area and uh, has placed very well at Gen Con <clears throat> and Worlds, I believe. So he's a legitimate player. So if you want to hear his opinions on Stark, I'm releasing that on Valentine's Day. Oh, oh. nice. I know. <laughs> so nice. Well, thank you, and we look forward to that. Uh, as always, shout out to everybody that uh, supports both myself and Joe and just the game, the Game of Thrones community as a whole. Uh, and pretty much that's all I got to say. I'm glad to be back. Uh, there's going to be a couple more Star Wars Destiny things down the line as I hit tournaments for that as well, because the Game of Thrones tournaments have slowed down a little bit in these parts anyways. So are we supposed to call you Throne Destiner now? Well, I, I no longer Destin- play Netrunner, so I'm, I'm, I was Destiny, thrown, thrown ran Destiny, for a bit. Destiny Throner? Throne Throner was what you were before, but now, yeah. now you're Star War Throner. <laughs> Destiny Throne... I don't know. Well, I, we gotta, <laughs> we'll, figure that, we'll figure that out a little, a little later as I yeah. jump into more games. Legend of, when L5R comes out, I'll be like Legend of the... Of <laughs> Legend Thrones. of the Throne Destiners. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, guys, everybody, thanks again. As always, peace out, take care, and we'll see you at the next one. Later. Peace.